Well, this evening I want to um, return to Philippians chapter 3 and, and read not the entirety of the uh, chapter, but at least verses 7 through uh, 16. And, and as I read this, I, I want us to uh, just compare what we see in the Apostle Paul with what we've seen in our Lord Jesus Christ uh, this morning. We'll, we'll just sort of make a um, compare in our own minds or a, a comparison, and then as we're sort of introducing the subject, I'll just point out a couple of things that I see, uh, things that, again, we see in the Lord Jesus and things that we would hope to see in ourselves and want to see. But again, remembering, it doesn't happen automatically. It's hard work, but it's work that is possible because of what Jesus has done. So this is what we read in Philippians 3, uh, beginning in verse 7. Um, Paul, after talking about his past and all his great accomplishments, says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, but dung, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Uh, may the Lord uh, bless his word to our uh, understanding this evening. I just want to point out we are going to make some references to this text, but what we're really doing is going back to the text we looked at this morning, the example of Jesus, and to see how we are to implement that uh, in our own lives. So let me begin by just reminding us of this morning we saw that Jesus was, of course, uh, a disciple. And he was a perfect disciple, a disciple of his Father. Now, that's the role that Jesus took in what we call the covenant of grace. The Son agreed to become a man and to basically take upon himself the obligation to do what was necessary to save us, what Adam should have done, what each of us are actually called to do, but, of course, which we have all failed to do. In order to do this, he was discipled by his father. Isaiah writes of him in Isaiah 50 verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. Uh, we know that Jesus listened to him. Jesus learned from him. Jesus absorbed everything that he heard of the Father because his word was precious to him. I think we have to agree that like David, and much more than, than King David, he found the Lord's truth to be, as, Psalm, as David writes in Psalm 19, verse 10, more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, uh, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Jesus loved the word. He treasured up God's truth. And of course, he gave it away freely as our prophet. Uh, he entrusted this treasure to, to us so that we might become a part of God's people. He preached the gospel to us. And of course, he taught us what we needed to know as well to live a life that is pleasing to him. 
Now, we know the Lord Jesus didn't just teach the Word of God. He didn't just learn it and teach it. That's something I think that we're pretty good at as Christians and also within our churches. But He did something that's a little less common. He, he lived that Word. Isaiah writes this in Isaiah 50, verse 5, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Remember, we saw this morning our Lord Jesus bound himself, heart and soul, to serve his Father, knowing what it would cost him, that he would have to give his life in order that he might save us. Isaiah writes in verse 50, or excuse me, chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. And as we know, this was a prelude to his going to the cross to bear the curse uh, for us. Uh, Jesus was willing to do whatever the Lord, his Father, called him to do. And he was willing to do this because he knew that his Father would help him. He knew that he wasn't running a fool's errand. He knew that in the end, he would not be put to shame. In verse 7, we read, For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. And so he set his heart to reach that goal. So we saw this morning he served his father with an unwavering commitment. He would complete the work the father gave him to do no matter what. And that's what he means when Isaiah writes in verse 7, Therefore I have set my face like flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. Jesus was steeled himself. He was adamant. He was going to move forward. Nothing was going to stop him. So Jesus is the perfect disciple. And this is the example that we are called to follow. Now, we read Philippians 3 this evening so that we could see, as I've already said, that this is what the Apostle Paul was actually doing. And I would say is also why the Apostle Paul was so fruitful. I mean, there were also gifts, of course, and there was the, the energies that the Lord gave him. There was that calling that he placed upon his life. There was what the Lord had planned to do with his life. But I think we can all certainly be more fruitful if we follow this example. So what do we see in Paul's life? Well, Paul says he had given up everything in order to follow Jesus. Everything he previously thought was of importance his nationality, his heritage, the fact that everything was done to him according to the law, the fact that he had excelled in the law as a Pharisee, even beyond his contemporaries, he said all of that he gave up, even everything that he had, because he wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to be found in him on that final day, clothed not with the righteousness that he was able to gain from the law, which is dung, is filthy rags, but rather clothed with the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wanted to experience power, uh, the power of his resurrection. That would be the power of his Holy Spirit. And notice he also wanted to participate in something we don't often think of wanting to participate in, and that is in his sufferings. And I think Paul, above everyone else in Scripture, appears to have suffered more for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, suffering is a part of the Christian life. And if we're not willing uh, to suffer for him, there's not much we're going to be able to do because we're always going to be afraid something's going to happen to us that we don't want to happen. Paul didn't have that fear. As a matter of fact, he looked forward to sufferings. He wanted to participate in those sufferings, even as our Lord Jesus, we're told in Isaiah 50, was willing to do what his father called him to do in spite of the humiliation and the shame and all the things that came along with it. Uh, Paul knew that these were really the evidences that he was in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he would be counted among the righteous at the judgment. Remember what Paul said to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So godliness brings persecution. It's part of the price that we have to be willing to pay in order to follow him. And so Paul wanted to participate in that suffering. And of course, as you go through the sufferings of Christ, you, you learn more intimately what he is actually like. I think the people who are most like Jesus are the ones who have suffered the most uh, for him. Paul was resolved to take hold of the life that Jesus had called him to 
with the same kind of commitment Jesus had shown to the Father. And I think we see that in verses 12 through 14 of Philippians 3. He writes, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, one purpose, one goal, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that, Paul is telling us, is what we are called to do as well. As he says in verse 15, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you, uh, also to you. So Jesus was the disciple of his father, and he now calls us to be his disciple and to exhibit then this same kind of commitment to follow uh, the example that he has given to us. So let's consider then for a little bit how we might follow Jesus' example. Now, one thing I just want to clarify is the fact that we are all called to be disciples. A disciple, uh, you know, we use the word Christian and we use the word believer so often and, and we don't often hear ourselves called disciples. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is because not every uh, group of evangelical Christians believe that that all of God's people are actually disciples. They see it almost in some communions as a, a second step. You're saved, and then if you want to get serious, you become a, a disciple. But what we need to see, first of all, is that we are all disciples if we're trusting in Jesus. That is what Jesus calls us to, is discipleship. It's what the Christian life is really all about, discipleship. Uh, it's not for a select few, it's for everyone who follows Jesus. In Scripture, everyone who followed Jesus was called a disciple. Uh, it was the disciples that were first called Christians, remember, at Antioch. Uh, the Great Commission is all about making disciples, not making converts, uh, although in a sense, yes, but to disciple those converts. Now, a disciple is a learner, one who is taught by a master, who listens to him teach and who looks at his example and stays with him under his tutelage until he becomes like him. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, verses 24 and 25, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he becomes like his teacher and the slave like his master. That is the goal of discipleship, that we become like the master. Now, Jesus is our master. And we are to learn from what he teaches us and, of course, from his example, how to become like him. This is really the Father's plan. That's the reason why he saved us, is that we might become like Jesus. Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, and remember, he, that means the forelove, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, this doesn't mean that we're, we're going to be like him just when we get to heaven, but this process begins on earth. That's also why our Lord Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit, so the Spirit of God would give us the ability to become like him. Okay, we remember Jesus uh, was fully man, and we already saw he was a disciple, and, and he learned many things, uh, the thing, or what, not the thing, but what helped him to do this, uh, what enabled him to do this was the Spirit. And as we saw with Dr. Ferguson when he was teaching us on Wednesdays, as the Spirit was his close companion, his teacher, his comforter, his, his guide. So Jesus has given us his Spirit so he might do the same uh, for us. So Jesus has given us the Spirit so that we might become like him, so that this work of discipleship can go on, that can make, is possible, and can go on with, of course, uh, power. But it's also a work that we're involved in. You know, we need to yield to the Spirit of God as He seeks to lead us. We need to listen to Him. We need to follow Him. We need to surrender 
uh, to him as he seeks to work this image in us, as he seeks to transform our hearts and our thinking and the words that we speak and the things that we do as he transforms our lives into the image of Jesus. Now, what does that look like? Well, it looks like what we've already seen. It looks like what Jesus did. It looks like what Paul was doing. But we need, I think it'd be helpful for us to consider each of those things we saw this morning perhaps a little bit more closely. So what does it look like? Well, it looks like Jesus. What, and what was Jesus like? Well, we saw first of all that Jesus was a learner. Jesus listened to his Father. Jesus grew in his understanding. He grew in his love for the Word. So Jesus soaked it all in. Jesus was a quick learner, we noted this morning. Remember that when he was 12, he amazed the teachers who were in the temple. When he was 30 and he was in the midst of his ministry, uh, those who were schooled in the law and had been you know, to the places of learning and were educated were amazed at his understanding, even though he hadn't been to their schools. Jesus learned quickly and thoroughly because of his love for his Father. Jesus wanted to please him, and he wanted to learn, of course, what it meant to please him. Again, it sounds kind of strange, I know, because we think of Jesus being completely in the know, as it were, but he grew in his understanding. He grew in, in wisdom, as we've read in Luke, and you can't do that if you come into the world with perfect knowledge. So every time Jesus had the opportunity, whether in his family growing up or in the synagogue as he was growing up, he soaked in the Word of God. He remembered it. He treasured it up. He cherished it. He held on to it. You know, love is key to everything that the Lord calls us to be. And not just the love that we show to other people, that we're called to show to other people, but love for the Lord, love for the Father, and love for His Son. If we don't have that, we're not going to be able to do this. That's why we need the Spirit of God. But we need that love to be strong. And love is, I think, arguably the most powerful affection that is in the human soul. Love is something that will compel you to, to go beyond, I think, uh, whatever any other affection might actually compel you to do. And obviously we know from our own experience, love compels us to try to please the object of our love, the one that we love. Well, Jesus loved his Father. He loved his Father with all his heart. If we want to follow Jesus' example, we need to love his Father. We need to love him with this kind of love. But again, this is what Jesus has given to us by His Holy Spirit. But we also know we need to cultivate that love because the stronger that love is, the better it will be. The more powerful it is, the more, of course, we'll, we'll get into the Word of God, the more we'll read the Word of God, the more we will cherish the Word of God, the more we'll focus on it so we can understand it, the more we'll hold on to it and remember it. You know, Jesus advanced very quickly in his understanding, but it's because he had a heart that was committed to his Father. Now, we saw, secondly, that Jesus committed himself to his Father, like the bondservant in the Old Testament, who joined himself out of love to his master's service. Jesus joined himself with his whole heart to his Father's service to do what was pleasing to him, as we saw, no matter what the cost even if it meant taking upon himself our guilt and suffering in our place, coming under the curse of that broken covenant, of the guilt of those sins, coming under the curse of God on the cross, that was what Jesus was willing to do in his service to his Father, which means he was willing to pay any price. Now, that's the kind of commitment that the Lord desires from us to be willing to pay whatever, of course, he would call us to pay, to have that kind of, of uh, commitment to him. Now, he doesn't want us, of course, to go to the cross. I mean, Jesus has already done that. But we do need to remember that he does call us to take up our crosses. Uh, it's, it's the kind of commitment that Jesus has made possible through the work of his Holy Spirit, and it is what he called us to do when he called us to himself by his Holy Spirit. 
You know, Jesus was joined with his Father and committed to him. By the Spirit of God, Jesus has actually joined us to himself, and we have become a part of him. And as a part of him, we also have this kind of commitment. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. This union with the Lord Jesus Christ is what causes this transformation, this opening of our ears, this changing of our hearts, this making us want to do what He calls us to do, to join ourselves to Him. We have that same desire in us that Jesus had with regard to His Father. We are joined to Jesus, and we want to show that commitment to Him through our lives. Now, here's where we have to recognize that we have a struggle, uh, a problem that Jesus didn't have, uh, and that is Jesus had a perfect heart, a perfect love for his Father, but sadly, we don't. We have his Spirit, we have the desire to honor and please him and to bind ourselves to him and to do his will, but we also have another desire in our heart that's constantly working against us to keep us from loving him as he calls us to do. So we have something to do that Jesus didn't have to do. We have to fight against that desire to do the things the Lord calls us not to do. We need to fight against sin. So that's why Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. He says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now what Paul is saying here is put aside your sins and put on Christ, and that's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. We need to fight against sin and put on Jesus. And he says to the Colossians essentially the same thing, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. You know, we we almost get the impression reading Philippians chapter 3 that as Paul looked back at his life, all he could see were all the good things that he did, although he will later in that chapter, call them refuse or or dung. But I think Paul would be the first one to admit that what he just said here also applied to him. Even though he was a Pharisee among the Pharisees and seemed to have some conformity to the law, all of this was still at work in his heart. And he had to put that aside. He had to lay that aside as well as all that he thought perhaps was of value. He says, put off your sins fight against them. Paul Paul writes in in Romans 8, 13, put them to death, mortify them, kill them. Don't let them continue to live in you. Put them aside and put on the Lord Jesus. So that's a battle that we're involved in that Jesus wasn't involved in, but it's one that we need to do if we're going to be able to become the disciples or, or be the disciples or progress in our discipleship of the Lord. We need to do essentially what that ear piercing represents, which we could see as basically killing the old man, uh, putting to death, as it were, that sin, and by the Spirit, as it were, making, uh, coming to life. And perhaps we need to look at what is represented by the blood. You notice that in the Old Testament, all the different things that they did had a lot of blood involved in it. Uh, the sacrifices were bloody, the Passover was bloody. Um, a lot of these rituals, circumcision was bloody. This piercing of the ear produces blood. 
uh, all of this blood that was constantly pouring was really meant to point us to the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that would be shed on the cross for our sins. So we need to look to that blood because it's at the cross that Jesus basically kills or gives, you know, he puts sin to death. When he died, he, he died to sin, Paul actually says. And when we died with him, we died to sin. And when, we were, when he was raised, we were raised with him to a new kind of life, now no longer to sin, but now to live that life of righteousness as servants of righteousness, to yield the members of our body as servants of Christ to righteousness and not to sin. He will give us the power to do this even as he did for Paul, if we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, remember the resources that are ours in him. We can't do it on our own. We need to look to Jesus. And if we do, he's promised that he will help us. So Jesus learns, uh, cherished, treasured up what his father was teaching him. He also uh, applied it to his life. He lived this kind of life. Now, thirdly, Jesus taught others what the father had taught him. Now, we don't have the same calling as Jesus. We're not the great prophet as Jesus was. We're not prophets in, in that full sense of the term. But all of us are called at some level to, to take this treasure that's been entrusted to us and to share it uh, with other people. And that I'm referring to, uh, what I'm referring to there is the gospel. Jesus tells us in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Now, this is a call to evangelism, and we know by now that not all of us, of course, are called to go to different countries, and, and we're not single-handedly to evangelize the world, but we all do have a part in the Great Commission. We are to take the seed of the gospel, have it with us at all times, and be ready to broadcast it whenever we have the opportunity. So if we would be like Jesus, we need not only to learn the truth and live the truth, but we need to share the truth with others. We need to be thinking about how to reach out to those around us with the gospel. Now, fourthly, Jesus believed and trusted that his Father would be with him to help him as he promised. We need to trust what our Lord Jesus Christ tells us, that he will also be with us to help us and to give us success. Uh, we essentially have the same promise that Jesus had. And again, notice what Jesus says in the Great Commission in verse 20, the part that I didn't read, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said he would be with us as we set out to do this work. He will help us. He will give us his spirit. He will give us the words to speak. He will protect us. He will use all the things that we face along the way, even all the difficulties, persecution, sufferings, whatever it may be. He will work them all together for our good. The Lord is with us. And if he's with us, who can really stand against us? The reason why we have hope that we'll be successful as we share the gospel is that Jesus is with us. He's commanded us to do this, and he intends to save people through what we're, we're doing. So like our Lord Jesus, we need to take what has been taught to us, and we need to give it away. Now, finally, Jesus committed himself to doing what the Father has called him to do, again, no matter what he had to face. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 50, verse 7, Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Now, this perhaps is one of the most difficult things that we have to do, and that is to try to keep moving forward, the purpose to keep moving forward, even though it seems like sometimes we're not moving at all, we're not making progress, nothing is happening. But... If we would follow the example of Jesus, we have to resolve to move forward and to follow him no matter what happens. This is what the Spirit of God is moving us to do. That's what he's working within us. Again, he's 
he's creating the image of Jesus in us. This is what Jesus did. But it's something that we also, in the work of sanctification, need to do along with him, to work with him in. Now, we're only going to be able to do this, to have this kind of commitment. And by the way, the secret to it, again, is love, isn't it? Love, strong love, desire for the Father, for his glory, desire for Jesus and for his glory, a desire to see other people come to Jesus. We're only going to be able to treasure his word, live his word, teach his word, trust him to, to protect us as we go out with his word and set our hearts to do that or our faces like flint to do that, no matter what the opposition. We're only going to be able to do all these things if we love him, if we love him with a strong love. And that means that we need to have hearts that are committed to him single in their goal. In, in our affections, there needs to be just one. Our hearts need to be undivided. So in order for this to happen, we do need to be willing to set aside the things that divide our hearts between Jesus and anything else. And what I mean by that is we particularly need to set aside sin because, as we know, sin, sin divides our hearts. Anything that grieves the Spirit of God, anything that grieves Him, quenches Him. It's like pouring water on the fire that's inside of our hearts. We don't want to pour water on them. We want to stoke those flames. I was thinking of um, that illustration in Pilgrim's Progress, an interpreter's house, where it wasn't meant to illustrate this, but it was sort of a concrete example where there's a fire burning at the base of this, of this wall, and there's a man who's pouring water on it, trying to put it out, but no matter how much water he puts on it, the flame just gets brighter and brighter and it burns even, even more strongly. And that's because there is someone behind the wall that's secretly feeding oil into the fire so that it doesn't go out. And of course, that's our Lord Jesus. But Satan, of course, is tempting us and wanting to get us into sin because he's believing that by doing this, he can quench those flames, and sometimes he does. But thankfully, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to keep them burning. But to learn from this example, we need to stoke that fire, resist the temptation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, was tempted by the enemy in every area that he tempts us. And he, was, he didn't succumb to his temptations. He stood firm and he was not weakened but strengthened. The Lord gives us the same grace and the same strength to resist the enemy. Uh, and as we do and continue to walk with the Lord and serve him and love him and, and do his will, that flame will grow even stronger. So resist sin. We need a strong love for the Lord. But let's not forget also the lesson that Bunyan taught us in Vanity Fair. And that is, it's not just sin that quenches the spirit, but even things that, that are in this world that, that are, are in and of themselves perhaps good, if they captivate our hearts and divide our hearts between Jesus and this thing, they can hurt us as well. Uh, we need to make sure that we draw all our affections together into one. Set our hearts on the kingdom to desire the kingdom, to be thinking continually about the kingdom. You know, you know how it is, um, I said this in my prayer because I know it's true, it happens to all of us. We're, you know, we're, we're in the service and hopefully, at least while we're in the service, we're, we're thinking about these things, you know, weighing them and we see them, but when the service ends, the thoughts seem to vanish and are, they, they go somewhere else, don't they? And what we need to do is keep them focused on the Lord. And then when we leave here, what do we think about as we're, as we're going home? As we wake up in the morning, what are we thinking about? Well, what was Jesus thinking about? At every single moment, he was thinking about how he could do what he did for the glory of God. It was continually on his heart, continually in his mind. And so he thought about it constantly, desired it, pursued it constantly. That's what it means to set your face like flint. One goal, one purpose, and that is the glory of God, honoring him, serving him, pursuing him the way Jesus did. That's what he really wants to teach us. 
we need to be, as, as Jesus said regarding John the Baptist's ministry when he began to preach, he said the kingdom of heaven was under assault by violent men, like, like violent men trying to take a city. That's the kind of efforts the Lord wants us to put into this. We can't be part-time Christians, you know, just practicing Christianity on the side, Sundays only. It has to be full-time, a full-time endeavor, a full-time pursuit. If it isn't, we're not going to make much progress. If we don't have a strong desire for this, our, the effort we put into it is going to be weak. But if that effort is, if that love is strong, we'll put a strong effort into it. If it's constant, it'll be a constant effort. And that is how progress is actually made in the kingdom of heaven. That's how we move ahead by following the example of, of our Lord Jesus. So may the Lord help us again to see what Jesus is like and to know his mind and his heart, what, how he saw the word of God, what he did with it. We, we need to follow that example if we're going to make progress in the kingdom of heaven and we need to resist sin, resist temptation, fight against sin. If we're not doing this, we're, we are not going to grow. We're going to be crippled. And if we don't grow, the kingdom of heaven isn't going to move forward, at least not through our efforts, but perhaps through the efforts of others who are following this example, uh, like Paul did, who was such, in the Lord's hand, such a powerful force to advance the, the kingdom of heaven. May the Lord help us all to be like that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask that the Lord would help us to do this.